Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the two to four player game, Corinth, designed by Sebastian Pochon and published by Days of Wonder, who helped sponsor this video. In the ancient world, you want to be known as the best merchant, and there's no better way to do that than to sell a variety of goods. And goats, apparently. Yeah, sounds about right. So, join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To set up, put this harbor board in the middle of the play area with the 12 dice nearby and give each player a sheet from this pad. Everyone will also need a pencil, and these are not included with the game. If you have four players, everyone now crosses out these first two dice on the turn track of their sheet. We're going to be setting up for three players in this video, so we won't cross out anything, but stick around until the end of the video to learn the small changes for how a game works with two players. Now, pick someone to be the first player and give them the nine white dice. And that's the setup. In Corinth, players will roll the dice and mark off areas on their sheet to represent gathering gold, goods, goats, and also selling those items, all in an effort to get the most points by the end of the game. The game is played over a series of rounds, and each round begins with the harbor purveyance step. Here, the first player crosses out the leftmost available spot on their turn track, and then they can choose to purchase up to three yellow dice at a cost of one gold each. If you have gold, it will be circled here on your sheet. So you don't own any of this gold yet, but everyone starts with one, which comes pre-circled. So the first player could choose to spend it to gain one die, which we'll have them do. And to spend gold, you just cross it off like that. The first player then takes all of the white dice plus any yellow dice that they purchased, and they roll them. All dice sharing the highest value are placed into the top row of the board known as the gold district. And then the rest of the dice are sorted by value and then placed in those groups into the rows of the board starting from the bottom and going upward. In this way, depending on what you roll, some rows, those ones towards the top, may not receive any dice. For example, in this case, I didn't roll any threes, so I only had enough groups to fill these first four rows. If I hadn't paid for a gold die, then this would be gone, and even more rows would be open. Now, in the very rare case that all of the dice you've rolled show the exact same value, well, then you just automatically win the game. And not just that game, but every game of Corinth you would ever sit down to play in the future. So you may as well just take a picture, share it on social media, and give your copy to somebody else. And I'm not kidding. That's actually in the rules. With the dice rolled and sorted, the first player now chooses any row on the board that has dice, collects them, and resolves that row's action. So let's take a moment and see how each of these actions work. And to do this, I will be moving the dice around and changing the values to suit my examples. Although, of course, in an actual game, you would not be able to do that. If you collect dice from the gold district, you gain an amount of gold equal to how many dice were there. So if I take three dice, I get three gold. The value on the dice doesn't matter. To gain gold, you just circle it on your sheet. So this is how I would record gaining three gold. If you instead take dice from this goat district, then you count the number of dice and circle that many goats on your sheet. You start the game with one goat, so this would provide two more. Now again, don't forget, on your turn, you only get to pick one row of dice. But rather than waste a bunch of sheets, I'm just showing you how these would work on a single one. These other four rows relate to how many goods you cross out from the matching colored districts here, representing deliveries you've made. And again, this is based on how many dice you collect, not the values printed on them. So if I took these two dice from the purple row, I get to cross out two symbols from this purple area. The good symbols within a row will be organized into various shops. And you can mark these shops off in any order. But once you start checking boxes off within a shop, any future deliveries you make to that market must be made to that shop first until it's complete. And then you can start crossing off symbols from the other shops. Once a shop has been fully delivered to, then circle the value above it. These are the points that you'll get at the end of the game. If a player is the first to deliver to all of the shops within a single district, and they've circled all of these, they will also gain this value here and circle that. The other players must cross this number out because they will not be able to gain this value in points even if they later cross out all of the symbols within that district. You'll also notice there's no special bonus for completing this market. When you take dice from the board, it may be possible that you can't use them or that you just don't want to take the related action. And in that case, you can instead choose to move the steward. 
With this action, you will not be looking at the number of dice that you collected, and instead you'll just count the value on one of those dice. So in this case, three. This becomes the exact number of steps that you must move the steward, who is located here on your sheet. And you can also spend gold that you have increasing or decreasing that number of steps by one for each gold spent. In this case, I don't have any gold to spend, but if I had two and I spent them, I could then increase the number of steps to five or decrease them down to one. To count steps, draw a line from the center where the steward begins to any one adjacent space following the path and then continue from there. Each circle that you enter counts as moving a step. And you'll continue moving and then draw a circle around the space that you ended up in and gain the benefit shown there. The next time you move the steward, you will continue from that space. As you take more actions with the steward, this area will fill up with more markings. And just note that you may never move through or end on a spot that has already been crossed out with a line or circled. If this makes it impossible to complete a full move with the steward, then you cannot choose to do this action. And that means later in the game, certain dice you would take will cause you to perform no action at all if you cannot perform either their regular action or move the steward. But on your turn, you must always pick one row to take dice from, even if ultimately you can't use them. With that understood though, let's go back and look at the various symbols you might circle and see how they work. If you circle any of these good symbols, then just cross off that number of those symbols from the related market area. Well, if you circle coins or goats, you then get the indicated number of them by circling them in these areas. If you circle a die, then on all future die rolls you make in the game, you automatically gain a yellow die to roll for free. If you end up circling several of these dice symbols, then you'll get multiple dice every time you roll. After circling any one of these spots, which you'll find here and here as well, you then trace backwards along the path that you traveled, counting every space you circled as one point, including this one. And you also gain an extra point for every one of these plus ones that you circled. So in this case, the player would gain one, two, three, four, five points, which you'll then mark in this area here. And I'm doing this upside down, so I'm not, actually, I think I got that one right. Okay, well then, if you later trace a path that would then take you to another one of these spaces and you circle it, then you'll start with the value that you gained in the last scoring space and then add to it a point for every space you circled since then. So in this case, I would get five plus one, two more for a total of seven. And I think this, yeah, I think I did this one backwards. All right, well, you get the idea. After taking a group of dice and completing your action, no matter what it is, you may then construct one or more of these four buildings here. And to do this, you spend the gold and or goats shown above the building by crossing them out. And then you mark an X in the space by the completed building. You will then gain the benefit of that building for the rest of the game. So let's go through each of these and see how they work. This here is the store, and it means that every time you take dice from the gold district, you get to circle two extra gold. So the player here would get four. This is the stable. Once you have this, any time you move the steward, you can increase or decrease its steps by one or two. And you can also spend gold to adjust its movement in addition to that, as usual. With the warehouse built, any time you deliver goods, check off one additional symbol in that district for free. And finally, with the temple built, you gain three points for each building you constructed, including this one. So at the end of the game, with all of these built, I would get 12 points. And those are all of the actions. After the first player has taken their dice from the board and completed the related action, constructing any buildings they wish to and can pay for, they then remove any yellow dice remaining on the board. And the reason for that is because they're the ones who paid for that yellow die to be there. So they get the initial benefit potentially from it, and then nobody else does. Now, the next player in clockwise order takes their turn, collecting a set of dice, performing the related action and building a structure if they wish to, and then the next player goes and does the same thing again until everyone has had one turn. Then all remaining dice are removed from the board. If you only have two players in your game, then again, after the first player is gone and Eola dice are removed, but then after the second player has taken their turn, the first player takes one more action and then the dice are removed from the board. 
The first player's second action of the turn is treated just like their first. They resolve the space that they drew the die from, they can purchase buildings, but they will not have access to the die they might have initially paid for. No matter the number of players, once you've cleared the board, you'll start a new round, with the player seated to the left of the previous first player becoming the new first player. And then they will cross out the leftmost symbol on their turn track, and then you'll perform another full round of play. Things will continue like this, with players crossing off the die symbols on their turn tracks. Again, not each time they take dice from the board, but instead each time they become the new start player of a new round. Until eventually, all of these symbols have been crossed off on everyone's sheet, and at that point, you'll proceed to final scoring. Now, going down this center row, you'll total and record in each space the points from the related areas. For these markets, total all the values you circled from completed shops, including any bonuses. For the steward, total any points recorded in these three spaces, and also gain one point for every two gold you have remaining, and one point for every two goats. Then collect any points from the temple if you built that. And once you have all of these points, total them into the space here. The player with the most points wins. In the case of a tie, the tied player with the most remaining gold wins. And if there's still a tie, the tied players share the victory. And that's how you play Corinth. If you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the game's page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notifications anytime we post a new video. But until next time, thanks for watching.